Yes, sir. What is that spectral plot? What is what? Spectral plot. Spectral plot. A plot. Yeah, what a we plot doing? of I guess it would be the magnitude spectrum or the phase spectrum. A plot of so the voting plots that we've been doing. Yeah, what should say just say just the magnitude or both or uh, is it one of the homework problems? Yes. Yes, it's spectral plus from that phase. So the magnitude of the days plus. The spectrum is more. Spectrum is for your transform. So, so the, the, the spectrum is another way to say the Fourier transform. And then Bode plots are a particular way to plot the Fourier transform in BD on a similar log axis. You, you could plot, you could do a spectral plot with the unit, linear units on a non semilog. A Bode plot is a specific plot. Okay, um, yes. Are you a big fan? No, not at all. <laughs> Actually, I've always kind of been a home team. I grew up supporting the Bengals and then lived in San Diego for a few years, lived in Syracuse for a few years, followed actually was a Giants fan there, but that's back in the Lawrence Taylor years. And lived in northern Ohio, followed the Browns, follow follow the Colts since I've been here. So no, I'm not I no, I don't like Tom Brady so at all. So, but I thought that was funny. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, me, yeah. Well, I'm no longer time scale. In fact, back in the Phil, before you guys were even alive, probably. Phil Sims, Sims Taylor. When was that? Was the 80s? Late 80s? Yeah. Man, you guys were not alive by a long shot. Um, active, so we talked about passive filters. I want to talk about active filters. And active filters are using, uh, they're a lot easier to design with because you can cascade them, put them one after the other, and you don't have to worry about loading effects like you do with passive filters. And that's, that's a big problem or design issue with, with passive filters. Um, so single pole low pass filter. So, and one of the homework problems you're you're asked to solve for the transfer function for a filter like this. So 
I think that, and several of these you, you can you can just use the result. So like each little pass of omega here is minus RF over RS one over one plus A omega over omega C, where omega C is one over RF C F. So you can usually you in your filter specification, you would want a particular cutoff frequency. With the active filters, they're also capable of providing gain. In this case, it would be the DC gain because with omega equal to zero, this reduces to just minus RF over RS. The negative sign just means it's an inverting amplifier. When you know if it's a sine wave input, when the input sign goes positive, the output sign would go negative. That's that's what the inversion does. But it's easy here, you know, to, with uh, an op amp design, you get a gain of ten. Just make make RF ten times RS, and you've got that gain of low frequencies. What this is going to look like, you know, on, on a Bode plot. Um, you know, with, with at omega C, it's going to be have a gain of if RF over RS is equal to 10. And in the Bode plot, it's the absolute value. So the sign would be taken care of in, in the phase plot. This would correspond to a gain of 20 dB. And then so at 10 omega C, it would be down to across zero because 20 log of 10 is 20. So it starts out at a gain of 20. And then we'd start going down into 20 dB per decade rate forever more. Okay, so that would be the corresponding Bode plot. So typically you might be given you know, a graph like this and, and, and be told to design a low pass filter, you know, maybe had a cutoff frequency of 2000 pi or 1000 hertz and a gain of 20 dB at low frequencies. So, you know, typically, what, what you might do is pick a standard value of capacitance, 10 microfarads or something, and then calculate the corresponding RF so that you get the cutoff frequency that we need. If that RF turned out to be you know, a really weird value, you might go back and then use a different value of capacitance. And then RS would have to be one tenth of RF in order to get that, that gain of 10 that you need. Okay, so pretty easy to do design with these. Now, where did this come from? I, I'll show you what, what I call my, my op amp analysis for Domi's method. It's uh, it's kind of a recipe for doing op amp analysis. It's not the one they usually teach you in, in circuits one. The method they teach you in circuits one kind of requires some intuition. Um, this method kind of kind of always works, but usually involves a little bit more algebra than the technique that you might have used in, in circuits one. Now I'm going to call this ZF. Okay, for a feedback impedance, and we'll come back to that later. But in this in this method, um, use nodal analysis at the inverting terminal of the op amp, and you let what we assume here, this is assuming the ideal op amp model. You assume that the current going into the op amp is zero, into or out of. That's the standard assumption with the ideal op amp model. It's two standard, there's two assumptions, well, three really, that the current into the op amp is zero, that the voltage difference here when feedback is involved is zero. And then the third assumption in the ideal op-amp model is it has infinite gain. 
Now, with infinite gain, you'd have infinite output unless the input were zero, right? So that's 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 where this uh, the voltage has to be zero comes from in that ideal model. And actually, we can use that. I mean, the, the gain of a real lock amp is more like two hundred thousand or something instead of being infinite. But this input voltage is not zero, but it's usually in the micro micro volt range so that the product gives us a finite voltage but that this ideal object model can be used to analyze circuits and get good results so here use nodal analysis at inverting terminal define i'm going to use uh, call it b subscript n instead of b minus so this the voltage here at the invert at the inverting terminal i'm going to call bn for b negative I'll call the voltage there would be P for B to be B positive. So with nodal analysis, the current flowing to the left is Vn minus Vs over Rs, right? That would be the current through that resistor. I always calculate currents going out from the node. So it's always the node voltage minus the voltage at some other point divided by that, that branch impedance. So the current going to the left would be Vn minus Vs over Rs. Vn minus our source voltage over Rs. And then the current going through the feedback impedance would be Vn minus V0 over Zs. Minus the output voltage over Z and then that's equal to zero. And there is no current going into the op amp. So they've only got those three branch currents and from Kirchhoff's current law, they sum to zero. Now, now you have to, this is why there's a bit more algebra in this method, but again, it always kind of gets you uh, an answer. Now we have to solve for Vn. The easiest way to get that here is actually the Multiply both sides by RS to ZF. So I have ZF VN minus VS plus RS times VN minus V0. And I'll keep my VN terms here on one side, ZF plus RS. Take my other terms, the other side. RS, VO, and then finally I get R, RS, RS, VO over ZF plus RS. Okay. So again, a bit more algebra than other techniques, but now we've got the voltage at the inverting input of the op amp in terms of the input voltage and the output voltage. Then we do the same thing at the non inverting input. Use nodal analysis at non inverting terminal. With I plus equal to zero to find V plus. Now remember the goal, the goal is to actually find V plus here. And this particular op amp configuration, that terminal is connected directly to ground. So VP is equal to zero. Okay, so I don't really have to do any nodal analysis in this circuit. Now in the non-inverting op amps, um, the both terminals actually have impedances from the terminal to the ground. And so you have to kind of repeat this step. So th this works regardless of whether here it's an inverted configuration, but this same technique also works for a non inverted configuration. But, but here there's no real nodal analysis. You just get VP is equal to zero. Then there's just one more step and then a little bit more algebra set. Vn equal to Vp, solve for the output voltage. 
So I solve for Vn here. I solve for Vp there. I set them equal to each other. I end up with a result then that doesn't have either Vn or Vp in it. And hopefully just involves the input and output voltages. Now, now I want to solve for the output voltage in terms of the input voltage. Again, the, the easiest way is in this case multiply through by the denominator on both sides. And I get ZF BS plus RS B0 is equal to zero. Or the output voltage in this case is what would it be? Take this to the other side. ZF over RS times the source voltage. Yeah. Now, you may remember that from the case where we just had a resistor here for the feedback. And then that, that's the result for what we call an inverting amplifier, which just had two resistances. It was minus RF over RS. So again, really easy to, to, to do that design with uh, operational amplifier. So we got the same result here as we should have. You know, I, I, threw, I, threw, I threw the, the resistor in the capacitor here and suggested impedance. I called it feedback impedance. So it's, it's the same result. We've got a, a little more work to do because this is what we should be getting. And so here is, well, what is my feedback impedance? It's the feedback resistance in parallel with one over J omega CF, right? So the product over the sum, J omega CF over RF plus one over J omega CF. So I'm gonna, Multiply by numerator and denominator by J omega CF. I get RF over, and rewrite it, one plus J omega RF CF. It's kind of a simpler form for the that parallel impedance. So plugging back into this expression now, I get VO is minus. RF over RS times one over one plus J omega RF CL. Which is almost in that final form. If you recognize that if I, if I let RF CF be one over, what do I call it, omega C, one over omega C, I drop my VS here. So we have BS so minus RF over RS over one, one plus J omega over omega C, where omega C is one over RF. So this is kind of the standard form for a first order low pass filter. So I know, and one of the homework problems that you're asked to, to, to analyze an, an op amp circuit that has impedance and then either in the feedback or the, the input resistance, and, and you get different filters. Okay. Um, this technique usually involves a little more algebra than, than typically, you know, the technique in circuits one. Um, you know, you solve it using the two op amp rules. So the input currents are zero, and then that voltage is zero, and then try to use some intuition there to, to, to solve the, um, to solve for the, the, the transfer function. The transfer function, you drop that BS. The transfer function is the ratio of BO to BS, right? It's the output over the input. So the transfer function in this case would be this. Now, I'm 
but you typically, you know, analyze a couple of these circuits. They're in the textbook. So you can, it's nice to be able to, to, to analyze the circuit, but it can be time consuming. Can't always trust what you find in textbooks or any reference books, because, any reference book, because they, they often contain errors. So sometimes you have to be able to derive the result. But, um, you know, assuming you've done that and maybe have, have got a, a reference build up, then you can just use the result instead of analyzing the circuit every time. That would be the goal. So here I've got input capacitance and then just a resistance in the feedback path. This is a high pass filter. You can show that the transfer function for this minus RF over RS. Again, at very high frequencies now, the capacitors are short, and at high frequencies, this looks just like an inverting uh, amp, uh, op amp, right? Over here, at low frequencies, with the capacitor being an open, this looks like uh, an inverting op amp with a gain of minus RF over R, RS. And at very high frequencies, this is a short, and your feedback impedance is zero, so it has zero gain at high frequencies. This is kind of the opposite. You know, if you think about, you know, the gain, the resistive gain is being RF this over this. Again, at, at low frequencies, um, this is infinite because of the capacitor being an open, and the gain would be zero, RF over infinity. But at high frequencies, this is a short and becomes RF over RS. And the corresponding Transfer function looks like this. And it's now RS and CS except the cutoff frequency for the high pass filter. So again, and uh, what would the transfer, what would the Bode plot look like for this? Well, not like that, but it would look like this. And it would have a 20 dB per decade roll off as we approach zero a decade you know whatever omega c is say it's a thousand then a decade below that at 100 gradients per second it would be 20 db below whatever this value is this value is rf over rs okay. at low frequencies this is zero which is a negative infinity db and high frequencies and and the limit here this just becomes one, and that, that um, becomes then minus RF over RS. Um, and one of the nice things you can do with active filters, because they have such a low output impedance, these op amps, you know, you run into you run into issues with, with passive filters. This is a first order low pass filter, a passive filter, but now I want to put two of those together. I have to reanalyze the overall transfer function isn't the product of H1 times H2. The reason is when I hook up this circuit, it affects, it has this loading effect on, when I hook up the second circuit, it has this loading effect on the first circuit. And I have to go back and I have to reanalyze the whole thing as, as a complete whole. You don't have to do that with active filters typically. I mean, <clears throat> and for, for the, the loading effect, I get into that. Just 
I'm not going to get into that. Just trust me. And for, because of the, the real ones, I want to talk about that. So if you think about think about uh, a covenant equivalent. Let's say this is a hundred dollars. We'll say this is ten volts. And now this is going to be attached to some load resistance. As long as the input resistance looking into the next stage is much larger than the output resistance looking back that way, I can kind of ignore the loading effect. And the, the rule of thumb is if the input resistance looking into the, the next stage is 10 times the output resistance, then I can essentially ignore loading effect. So if, as long as this is like a thousand or more, the output's going to be roughly 10 volts. Because if this is a thousand from the voltage divider, it'd be a thousand over 1100 times 10. It's a little lower than 10, but not much. Now, on the other hand, if this were 10 ohms, 10 over 110 is much less than one. I'll say it's about a 10, in which case the voltage here would just be one volt. Now, so we can ignore the loading effect when either the input resistance looking into the next stage, it, it, well, the rule is it has to be small compared to the output resistance of the previous stage. Now, that can happen in one of two ways. Either this, the input resistance looking into the next stage is really large, or my output resistance is really small, right? If this, if this is zero, doesn't matter what this is, I'm always going to have 10 volts there, right? Ideally. And then on the other hand, if this is infinite, doesn't matter what this is, I'm always going to have 10 volts right? because there's no current, there's no drop across that source resistance. So that's basically the issue with cascading passive filters. Now, I haven't talked about the output resistance of these op amps. The input resistance, you know, if I, if I hook this one up to another op amp circuit, the input resistance looking to that, this op amp is essentially RS. You'd have to prove that, but just because this is brown, you essentially just see an RS resistance here. But the output resistance of any op amp with negative feedback is essentially zero. It's usually in the millivolt range. It's really small. So because of that, you almost never have to worry about loading effects with operational amplifiers if they have negative feedback. Which means that you can cascade them together and find the overall response by multiplying the individual response. That makes design really easy compared to, can't do that with passive circuits. I have to just design, I have to analyze the whole circuit. So, cascaded filters, you know, I can, some of the problems in the textbook are, are like this. I can cascade a low pass filter. And a low pass filter would have a response like this. And then uh, cascade that with a high pass filter, where the cutoff frequency, frequency of the high pass filter is less than the cutoff frequency of the low pass filter. Now, what I get is the product of these two. Now, my low pass filter is essentially zero above omega LP. So the, this pro, and my high and my high pass filter is one. So I'm just going to get my low pass response. At lower frequencies, my low pass filter is constant. My high pass filter going to zero. So the product's going to essentially look like that. It would be you know, the product of this times the product of that. Now I have to make sure that my high pass cutoff is less than my low pass cutoff. If I don't, I get a no pass filter, which is useless, right? I get something that would be 
zero everywhere. So, but this would be one way to get a bandpass filter. I can cascade these first order low pass and high pass filters. So this would be my, my source voltage and my output voltage. My overall transfer function would be my low pass times my high pass. And my overall frequency response would be the product of the individuals. I can connect these in parallel as well, like this low pass filter. Maybe high pass filter. Maybe we'll make a HP. And then add these together. And if I set it up so that my low pass cutoff, so my low pass filter is going to pass everything up to omega LP. And then my high pass filter is going to, to pass everything above omega HP. So here I need to make sure that omega HP is greater than omega LP. And I get a, a band reject filter. Now to add two voltages like that, I need a summing amplifier. So it would require, in this case, with an active filter design, you know, at least three op-amps. So any questions about that? We're going to look at some filtering examples next week and do some filter design. But let's talk about before we do that, let's talk about perfect filters or ideal filters. Ideal pass filter. So this this would be a perfect low pass filter. Two pi FC minus two pi. Here I'm putting it using FC so I can have this in hertz. FC would be in hertz. So this would be my magnitude response. It would pass all frequencies up to some cutoff frequency and then completely eliminate any frequencies above that. So we can write this like this. It's one for omega less than two pi FC, and it's zero for all other omega. Now, just a simple example of what this filter would do. What is the output of an ideal low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 10 hertz when the input is the NFT? Is cosine of 2 pi 2t. Two I'm writing it like that just to make it easy to see that that's a 2 hertz sinusoid plus 4 sine of 2 pi 6t plus a 6 hertz sinusoid with an amplitude of 4 and then plus a 2 cosine of 2, two pi 20. and that would be a 20 hertz sinusoid. Uh, you know, we could work this in the frequency domain. You know, these would be impulses and impulse at, at plus or minus two hertz, and impulse at plus or minus six, and impulse at plus or minus twenty. We do that product, 
the, the impulse of plus minus 20 is going to be multiplied by zero because my frequency response is zero for frequencies above my cutoff frequency, in this case, 10. My, my output voltage in this case is quite simply though, it's going to pass through the, the lower frequencies. Now the, the output amplitude would be the amplitude of my filter times the input amplitude. So if my filter here has an amplitude of one. It's not changing, it's not changing the amplitude. Now I, I could have used that active low pass filter that had a gain of 10, in which case this would be 10, this would be 40. But here I just drew it so it had a gain of one. The last one would be completely filtered out. Okay, this is what we mean by, you know, what a filter should do. Pass through frequencies that are in the passband of the filter while eliminating other frequencies that are in the input. Now, why would we want to do this? I have no idea. It really depends on what you want your input, what you consider your input to be. For some reason, we've decided this thing is some sort of interference in whatever particular problem. Now, more typically in like audio applications, uh, you know, you want to pass through all, well, uh, for audio, I mean, you want to pass through all frequencies, maybe up to 15 kilohertz. But then there are certain applications where you, where you have, um, um, uh, mixers or equalizers, you know, an equalizer, it's really just a series of bandpass filters that boost certain ranges of frequencies. And you know, you can you can boost your bass or your treble, your higher frequencies or your lower frequencies or mid-band frequencies, but your equalizers are nothing more than you know a series of bandpass filters with adjustable gain. So that you can According to your uh, listening taste, you might like, like music with a lot of bass or not. And so that you could, in that case, you know, you, you, your desired filter re response, you know, maybe something with a, a lot of bass and then, you know, cut off on, on the higher frequencies. Or, you know, if you, want, if you like the mid band frequencies and not a lot of bass, you might want a response like that. And you can adjust your, your equalizer appropriately. But these are all more examples of you know, practical filters compared to you know, this ideal filter. Now, how do you find the impulse response? Inverse Fourier transform. Do you remember what the Inverse Fourier transform of a rectangular function is, or the Fourier transform. Remember, they're almost the same intervals. Remember what that is? That was the sink function. Did someone say it? So again, the Fourier transform of the sink is a is a. Uh, actually, I guess we looked at a, a, a pulse in the time domain becomes a sink in the frequency domain. But because our Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform intervals are almost identical, we have this duality. A sink in the time domain leads to a rectangular function in the frequency domain. So our low pass time domain response, in this case, would be 2FC sink. Two pi FC. You should find that in your table of Fourier transforms that you have. And if we plotted this, it's going to look like this. It would have a height of 2FC. And then the zeros here would actually be at one over two FC, and then multiples of that two over two FC, 
3 over 3 FC. Uh, we looked at, it's been a while since we looked at impulse responses, but how would you characterize that impulse response? It's, it's drawn in black marker and looks pretty. Any other more scientific terms we could apply? Symmetric. Symmetric, and that's sure I'll buy that. Even. Huh? Is it even? Even, even has even symmetry. Uh, what about, you know, what, what, what do we say about stability of the system? Do you remember in terms of the impulse response? It had to be absolutely unenderable. I believe that one is actually. Anything else we talk about? Stability way back on the first exam. What causality mean? Just in before the mirror. Yeah. Right. This is this is the response to an impulse that's arriving at t equal to zero. The response has to start before the impulse arrives. Right? It has to actually, you know, this thing is actually infinitely long. So we have to start this, we have to design a system. If we want this ideal filter, we have to design a system that starts producing this output before the input even gets there. That's not an easy thing to do. It involves time travel. We can't, this is an unrealizable system. It's not, we can't build it. Unfortunately, that's why it's called an ideal low pass filter. You can kind of approximate it. We can delay the response, shift it to the right, and then truncate it again. This thing's you know, these, these lobes get smaller and smaller. And that's actually one way to design low pass filters is delay this thing and window it. But we can't get this exact response because it's non causal, it's not physically realizable. Um, and unfortunately, that, that's a problem with most of these ideal filters. to find a band pass response like this. And because in the frequency domain, and it probably could have started in the frequency domain, this is that modulation property okay, multiplying by a cosine. So if you go back and look at your transform table, multiplying by a cosine would give us one half of the Fourier transform of this shifted to the right by omega zero. I threw a two in here so I could just get rid of the factors of one half. And then the response shifted to the left by omega zero. That, that's called the modulation problem. And but what that looks like would be that low pass response shifted to the right. And shifted to the left. So do the same with this is my band pass. This is exactly what I want for an ideal band pass response. You know, it passes through a, a range of frequencies without changing their amplitude at all in the pass band, and then eliminates all other frequencies.
So my fan pass impulse response taking my low pass response would be four FC sync of two pi FC times T cosine of two pi F zero G. You see any easy way mathematically to get maybe a high pass response from a low pass response in the frequency domain? What I want with a high pass filter is this. I call it two by FC. This is my ideal high pass frequency response. Mathematically, I can get it just by subtracting the low pass response from one. So Is just one minus a low pass response in the time domain. The inverse transform of one is an impulse. So this would be the, the impulse response of a high pass filter. Again, these are unrealizable, so why do we talk about them? It gives us something that's useful to compare to for mathematical purposes. So we can use tools like LT Spice or MATLAB to calculate the theoretical output of these ideal filters in some cases, or mathematical tools even though we can't build them in practice, we can't have mappers or the building of practical filters. Um, he has the band, band pass reject filter in the book. I won't bother to write down the equation for that. It's simply one minus the band pass response would give us a band, an ideal band reject filter. It would be zero over this range of frequencies and one everywhere else. So have a good weekend. We're almost to the end of this semester. I hope everyone is registered for classes at this point. Yeah, it's a little